and what I mean by soft, like more entitled. They don't really know yeah. the um, the difficulties of what it was to be a pro back in the day. To be honest, let's call it the way it is. I've never, this generation, the majority of it that I've seen uh, are self-entitled and delusional. <laughs> Hey, let me uh, take one second here to let you guys know that my products, the Titan Crew, are available over at Walmart. You got the pump product, get that focus on the workout, the test booster, bump it naturally, and then the joint support. You gotta keep the joints healthy, that way you can train for a lifetime. I wanna take that one minute, let's get back into the podcast, thanks again. This is the Mike O'Hearn Show, and I have two incredible, incredible people on. <laughs> Actually, every week I have somebody incredible, but I got two guys on. I got Mr. Olympia, Phil Heath, and I could ramble off a list of things that he has accomplished in his life, and I would still miss a hundred things. And then I got pretty boy Frank Seppi on as well. And again, somebody that has been there a long time in the industry. And again, a list full of so much stuff you guys have no comprehension on how involved and, and, and the building he holds up from all the work that this man does for the health and fitness world. So let's skip all that stuff. Let's just get right into the show. Frank Seppi and Phil Heath. My brother. What up? What up? <laughs> well, thank you for the video the other day. I got to say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're my guy, man. So, you know, I'll always respond to you. <laughs> the thing with you is that you noticed the little details. And so you noticed the little tweaks I did for the, the last movie, for this movie, those final little details where most people just say, hey, the guy's cut up or this or that. You're finding the 1%, the minute things, the skin, that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're going through bodybuilding, of course, you start working on your initial strengths, right? Whether it be chest or biceps, whatever. And then after a while, you see how imbalanced you are. And then you start doing legs, calves, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But up until the point where you start competing, you really don't know like how far your body can go. And what's been very impressive is that you've been able to acquire different looks throughout your life, really, um, pertaining to jog, uh, aside from competition. So that's what I find very <laughs> remarkable because you know you get to step in the two worlds and always maintain a level of positivity i've never seen you like ultimately down there's a thing where you could look down but you're really just hyper focused um and that's what i've noticed but as you get uh more experienced and in, in your craft you particularly always seem to find a way to challenge yourself so whether it be through your diet, through, you know, different types of training, I know you have your power building stuff that's, I've been following that for a long time. And I've just been impressive because a lot of people say, well, why you lift all that weight and this and that? And it's like, is Mike's proof in his performance? Well, yeah. Well, then maybe you should listen. <laughs> so when it regards to um, a certain type of look, you're going through where, where the common person would probably look at like a, like a slide on a uh, ma uh, magnifying, uh, you know, like a scope, and it'd be like 25 times. As you get further along in your in your craft, you start to find like, I, in order for me to get better, I have to increase the magnification. And I have to increase it a little bit more. And yeah, that's gonna show things that I don't freaking wanna deal with. Because the average person can only see 25 times. But seven times Mr. Olympia can see it at 250 times. So that's where I see that resonating in your uh, journey, in your path, because there's never I can't. And you've been able to do it very healthy. And that's when the, the reason why I've always fanned your flames is because, you know, it's, it's not easy to provide different looks. As you can see in most bodybuilders, they only have really two looks. The day on the shake. The, the day on the show day and the day, uh, you know, like off season. What I mean by that is 
if you look at Ronnie Coleman, if you look at really all of the Olympia champions, all of our winning Sandows had different looks. So that means what? You had to change. Your body is not static. It's very dynamic, as you know, Mike. So you got to change your diet. You can't do the same cookie cutter diet that you wrote yourself that one last time. So your mind can go like bonkers. And I'm sure Mona would be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> you know? But at the same time, that's where the mental toughness has to exist to reduce all the emotions and stuff and just stick to the game plan and change it up if needed. So, you know, I, I think what you're doing is, you know, we've never seen it, you know, and I, and I think it's very valuable that we have now social media to address it amongst many people around the world. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that tremendously because um, talking to you or, or, or talking to Lee, uh, Lee Haney, <clears throat> Frank Zane, you know, it, Arnold, it's, for me, I, I, I instantly look past the physiques to the mindsets because I realized, you know, many years ago, uh, decades ago, that it's the mindset that just really separates an individual, not the body. And I think uh, C.T. Fletcher said it the best the other day. He says, hold on. You're saying your back hurts because you watch Mike do his birthday squats with 315 for 40, 50 reps. That's pretty – you hurt because you watch somebody do something? It's like the mindset for this world is seeming to – always go to the negative instead of I'm going to push this envelope and I'm going to see what's possible. And I, it's, you know, that's my, my career and to watch and talk to you, it takes me up a level to have you around me and conversate. And I have, a, have, to, have to ask a question because you got a, a, a strong significant other. And so my question to you is because I got somebody in the house the Romanian gangster, which <laughs> She always says to me, you Americans are weak. You know, <laughs> your yeah. mindsets, your mindsets, you should be stronger. Yeah. And that's helped me. How has having somebody like that in the house helped oh, you? Oh, my gosh. I've been very blessed, you know, to, to, have, to have Cherie in my life, almost eight years now, um, has made all the difference between me um, falling into heavy extreme arrogance to um, falling into the worst depressions I've ever had in my life. Um, she's been able to see all the highs, the super highs, the super lows, and still keep her own composure and show so much grace to me while still finding out those key points where she could interrupt interrupt my my trauma and say, look, like, I know you're going through it, but remember what you said. Through the rain and the pain, you're still gonna, you know, get after it, no matter what. And sometimes it wasn't even her having to say anything. It was just her presence, her positivity. She would go with me to the gym, and, you know, I trained super late, and um, she would be there. And I'd tell her, like, oh, no, don't worry about it, just stay home, you know, I'll be fine. And she's like, no. like. I care too much. Like, what if you fell asleep behind the wheel or, or what if you were squatting and you needed a spot or just, just anything. And I'm like, you know what? I've got it made. But what's, what's really awesome is to know that her strength is like yin and yang. If I'm down, she's up. We don't both, like we both try to elevate each other and I'm, I'm obviously, you know, in love with the woman. So, I mean, I'm very fortunate to, to have someone even see me win, see me lose, and treat me the same. Like, treat me the same. Like, I can joke with her. Um, I can be hilarious or not so much, I guess. But, you know, she brings a lot of the, the stuff that people are just now seeing um, with me not having to hyper-focus on comp competitions. So I say that she's been doing a tremendous job and yeah, I mean, of course, if it really comes down to, I think Mona is the same way. Our women are highly competitive. And I think that's what makes them so special is because 
when you deal with a person day in and day out that isn't competitive, you think your your energy is going to be at a, a high every day? Absolutely not. So if Mona says something, it's because it's the truth. If Sheree says something, it's pretty much the truth, and the truth hurts, but she's your best friend, right? So it's Do like, you want the opposite? Does anybody want the opposite of that? Because I don't, I don't understand. I don't want the, I don't want the cheerleader. Right. Right. Uh, think, you look great. This guys, is good. Yeah, I think uh. a lot of guys, they say they want like a badass. They say they want someone that until they, they get one. Yeah, they, they say they want a woman that they can walk shoulder to shoulder with in any, you know, disruptive situation. And the answer is they're lying. You know, they they want to feel like the man. And what they don't recognize is that if you're being a real one, she's gonna follow. Like, why wouldn't she? And um, it's it's good to know that a, if you're a lion, you can't have a hyena, you can't have a donkey. You got to have a lioness, man. Lioness can still kick a lot of ass, take care of the family and stuff. So, you know, I think self empowerment on that on the spouse is is important. But also, I think a lot of guys are. I think a lot of guys, especially in this sport, because you see, we've seen it. They'll bounce around from girl to girl, this and that. You know, when yeah. really the common denominator is they don't know what they want, and they're afraid that if they have it, they're going to get bored, and they're, and maybe they're dealing with some um, internal issues pertaining to wanting fame, wanting the world to love them. Maybe because someone didn't love them when they were a child. It probably goes very, very deep, because I've seen tons of guys lose some pretty dope. <laughs> women right and they all happen to be very strong-minded people and i'm like you're gonna you're gonna hate yourself in 10 years from now when you're done they're gonna lose that kind of girl because that girl will say you know what i'm walking out i got no yeah. issue walking out dude i'll find somebody better and they and it's funny because majority of the time they do they do they have kids right away you're like damn like it's like that it's like yeah dude you were holding her back so it's a it's a lot, man. I mean, a lot of people have to uh, do a lot more self checks, you know, self care, and there is really no hundred percent balance of bodybuilding and business and marriage and all this. Stuff. It's not balance. It's just what's on your totem pole right now. What can you tackle? Like, if you're in the gym, you know how many minutes you have to be there. That means for the next ninety minutes to two hours, you can't like not be focused. Okay. So if you tackle those two hours and you have two hours of filming or whatever, and you attack every task with a hundred percent, you'll create some balance because you know that you did everything you could with all your tasks. But I think bodybuilders, you know, especially the guys, they, um, they, they find a way to kind of biohack their physiques and then they forget that they should be more in tune with their soul. And they should be more in tune with their emotions and how they present themselves, not just to their, you know, significant other, but just like when you walk in a room, like I'm not saying be fake, but I do believe that if you are at peace with yourself, you could deal with the world. You know, I'd rather be at peace with myself and fight the world than try to be at peace with the world and have an inner fight with myself every day. Those are the people that blow their brains out and they're a billionaire, you know. So the two things we covered so far is you got to push the envelope, mostly with a career like, I mean, I think I think I got on stage before you were born, 83. <laughs> what year were you born? I was 79. So okay, so I, you were, <laughs> you're already posing in the diapers. So, and I was in the magazine since the, the 80s. So it's the 80s, the 90s, 2000, 2010, 2020, and now we're into 20 almost 23. So I continue to change and change. And you said one of the biggest things about you is that you, you micro saw yourself and continued to change to be a multi champion. And that's what the people have to understand. If something's not working, change it. Or if something's working, it may not work again. So change it again. And then the second thing was the circle around you. And I've noticed that I think that's the most epic thing about you is that you have a circle and you don't waver from that. You don't, uh, Mona says, don't let everybody in your circle. Not everybody yeah. gets to get in there. And yeah. you got to be protective at this point, and especially somebody like you that's at such a high level that is in such demand. But I got one more question for you, but I am not going to ask this next question. 
I'm going to bring in a special guest, probably the one of the prettiest men in the health and fitness world ever to be. <laughs> well, now this handsome be- Superman yeah. looking from the East Coast, Frank Seppi, yeah. my brother Phil. <laughs> the, we're the we should we should go on the road with this guys like uh, we're a boy band now right? right yeah right we could frank why no headband <laughs> i'm not in the gym mike i'm like okay. you know, all right go. like still okay. turns the hat on backwards <laughs> uh, <laughs> over the top baby over the top it's like a switch um <laughs> Phil, I've interviewed probably, well, I've interviewed you about 100 times, 45 minutes sometimes, but I never asked you this question. I don't want you to be offended or I don't want you to even worry about politically about your answer, okay? Right. But if me and Mike were cast in a movie, who would be the villain and who would be the hero or the, the good guy? <laughs> I mean, typically you're going to say Mike, but... You know, Brett might be the hero because, because you know, we can always see Frank as the villain because you got a little more of a temper, right? But, but here, here's the thing for me it seems like there's always like the, 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 the dude that looks like Mike that turns. Ah, yes, you know, it puts the lotion on, yeah, he, he got and that, but he's. He's the one that's double crossing the government or whatever. He's like doing the espionage. And then you're the one that has to find out all the details of what he's doing, uncover everything. And Mike's the one in the billion dollar. He's the one in the Bentley building in Miami, $60 million freaking home with the pool and all that crap. He's got the soldiers all around and this and that. You're the one that's being more resourceful, trying to get him. See, I'm working in my head, right? I'm writing this down now. Okay. Call, call Danny Garcia and see if we can get this uh, green lit. <laughs> that would be, if it was, brother, if it was that easy, man, I would have probably tapped myself already. <laughs> what do you mean I have a temper? <laughs> You're Italian, brother. I'm just loud. <laughs> I want to take a second from my show to say thank you to one of our sponsors, Transcend. This is the health and wellness company that my family has chosen to work with. They get your blood work done so you understand what is going on inside. We might look good on the outside, but you never know what's going on. So that's who I'm recommending for you guys out there. Get on over to Transcend. Get your blood work done today. Make sure you're healthy and stay in the game. And I'll tell you what, um, you have a right to be because I need to say it, man, but as much as you've been in this industry and seen the changes over time, mm-hmm. Mike and I were talking about something. It was kind of a theme of just people overall just being kind of soft, right? Yep. And you've been able to see that quite a bit. And what I mean by soft, like more entitled. They don't really know yeah. the um, the difficulties of what it was to be a pro back in the day. So when they speak to maybe promoters or gym owners, these new people have like a, a lack of respect in my opinion, because they don't know the history. So I, I tend to try to, you know, I'm 42 now, now I'm like the OG and I tell the younger guys, I'm like, you don't understand. I was probably, I was probably the last Mr. Olympia to know what it felt like to get a magazine cover and yeah. see a picture in the airport and people stop you like legitimately like stop your ass and say, my grandson has your poster in his room. And I I just need to get a picture and stuff. No one really does that now because of social media. And everybody can be an influencer that looks like Mr. Given the Mm -hmm. Photoshop program. So, you know, it's just. I got to stop you for a second because I think it's a great point. And I'm trying to find out the root of that. And so with the root, we, uh, we did sports. We won, we lost. You know, I wrestled. Uh, there's times I grinded the guy's head out. Sometimes I lost. There's a, different things of guys that are in the trenches and doing it and stepping on stage, standing next to another guy that's complete and win, lose, or draw. At least you're in the battle. And there was a, like a, a, a respect, a blood respect of sweat and tears and doing it. Is that what's missing for a lot of Instagrammers? Because a lot of Instagrammers don't have to compete. 
All they have to do is look good by themselves and go mm -hmm. post. Well, you know what? Back in the day, you'd go backstage, and that's the first time you're seeing who you're competing against. You don't know who you're competing against. Now yeah. everybody's on social media and like, oh, I can beat that guy when they're, you know, pulling up the sharpness, going on the lighting, changing the lighting, making yeah. themselves look good. But to be honest, let's call it the way it is. I've never, this generation, the majority of it that I've seen <laughs> uh, are self-entitled and delusional. Um, you know, they do two shows and they expect a pro card. You know, they had no idea, like back in the day, you'd have to go up against Kevin Lavrone, Matt Mendenhall, uh, Jamea. Like, you had the best guys in the world, and they were fifth and sixth. They don't even look at these videos. I know exactly what you're talking about. Junior yeah. National 1991, bro. Like, Ronnie Coleman and was fifth place. <laughs> I was there. I saw that lineup. Well, what about and you, Phil? I mean, you competed against Dexter, Jay. You had... Three Mr. You know, you had Mr. Olympias in your, you know, in your category, in your, in your on stage with. That was your introduction. You know what I mean? Like some of these competitors, like it's funny. I ran into a guy at the gym and he's got a, a belt and it said IFBB Pro. Now, he's probably about 40 years old. So he's like, and he's just mouthing off in the gym and he's going on and on and on. Yeah, I'm a pro. I go, so he's, I, I'm, oh, I'm listening. He's like, where did you turn pro? He's like, I turned pro at the universe. And, you know, I, it's my second show. And I'm, uh, and I'm looking at it. And I'm like, I couldn't look that shitty if I ever, if I tried. Like, in my history and, like, whatever, I couldn't look that bad. Yeah. And, and you know, and be a pro. And I'm saying, and I'm saying on stage because he just finished his show. I'm like. What is going on? I think it comes down to like with with the whole belt thing. Um, you know, shout out to Steve Cardillo. You know, like he always yeah. belts for all the USA champs, you know, all the people that turn pro. Um, that that actually meant something when you would get that in the mail. Um, yeah, a person that would introduce themselves to you as IFBB Pro. I've had it happen at least ten times, mm -hmm. and I think it's them trying to. Uh, you know, introduce themselves like we are peers, you know, like don't look at me as a scrub because I'm a pro too. Um, whereas really, I just care if your name is Frank or Mike or whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Well, that I'm like, if I walked up to you mm -hmm. and said, hi, my name is Phil. He's seven time Mr. Olympia tied with Schwarzenegger. Is, I mean, I'd have to sound like a theatrical being, you know, like Thor yeah. or something, right? With the trumpets playing. Like, that's not cool. You know, he's got, yeah. and trust me, I've talked to girls about this too. I go, Hey, before you turn pro, let me ask you a question. I go, what? I go, so what's the first thing you're going to do on online? Hmm. Oh, I'm going to change my name. Change the name. I have people, yeah. yeah. And I go, yeah. <laughs> and I go, I go okay. So what are you going to change it to? I'm just curious. IVB pro Jane Doe. And I'm like, hmm. so is that going to be red on your headstone? You know, excuse me, and I'm like, no. like, who are you outside of the sport? Well, I'm a mother of three. I'm a wife. You know, I I run two businesses. This and that and the other. I'm like, wow, that's hell of a bio. I would probably put that there. Yeah. And, hey, you know, you know, mother of three or whatever. Run this company. Tag your company. Put IVB Pro within the bio and just leave it be. And and of course she, they all didn't take my advice. I'm like because. You're thinking that that's going to matter. What's going to matter is what they see on your social media. So if you're IBB Pro and you haven't won anything, I don't know, man. Like, how much respect are you trying to get here? Like, yeah. I think what's more impressive is that you have a life outside and then people can find out, like what Mike was saying, like what's going on in here when you're dealing with sure. raising kids and being married and running businesses and still competing. Now, that is a story. You know, Phil – Yourself, um, Aaron Banks, Andre Ferguson, Brandon Hendrickson, Big Rami, the nicest people in the world, Ar Andrea Shaw, people who are accomplished, who have won titles, seem to me to be more gregarious with their time and everything else 
than some of these people who are entitled and think that they should win shows. I hired a uh, uh, an assistant at one point, and um, this was back with you know in the days of metrics and Nicole Wilkins. We were going to do a photo shoot for Nicole Wilkins. She went up to Nicole Wilkins and she said, "In five years, I'm going to beat you." She spent well. She was fired, but she spent like maybe a couple of weeks in the gym before she said that. Like, you know, when I go up to somebody like Lee Haney, who I think is amazing, he's a great guy, I love Lee Haney, he's a yes. family man, a church guy, yep. great. And Lee tells me something or whatever, I, I have nothing, I would never go up to him like, yeah, Lee, I have better, that I'm, you know, I'm there as a, to learn and to <laughs> just be in his presence and say, hey, you know what, I'm glad you're giving me the opportunity to speak to you and I'm, I have nothing bad to say about you. And it's like, I've interviewed so many people, Phil, like back in the day and going into the Olympia and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna crush Phil. And I'm like, have you seen the pictures? <laughs> like, like, you know, like I, I don't need to be a pro judge to say that you don't have a chance. I'm like, it's good to be confident, but I'm just saying like the people who seem to be more like who have climbed that ladder and have been at wars in, in, on the stage, appreciate it more and take the time with their fans and stuff. And they're really, really nice people. And Ivy Pro League has a ton of, of people like that. But it seems to be the, the people who are not as accomplished and who are angry <laughs> are not. Yeah, yeah I, I think that goes back to the, the original point is like, there's something different about going through the trenches, being in the trenches for a long period, not one, two shows. I mean, going through the trenches and yeah. being there and, and, Winning, losing, and going through it, um, but also like Phil said, the outside life on what you're dealing with to go through that. It, it's impressive to us three. Yeah. And, and my training partner, as soon as he turned pro, I said, don't, please don't. Don't go to IFBB, then your name. Put it on there. That's yeah. fine. I, I get that. But still be like your name, like a fur daddy. <laughs> I like that one yeah. for both guys and girls. Put fur daddy or my... And then, you know, what you do and, and then that on there, because it's it's great. But I think, again, like Phil was saying is, and or you guys both have talked to me about this, is that back in the day, it was like two pro cards back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. You know, it wasn't that was when you no, got that. Yeah, it was it was it's to the point where. All right. I turned pro at the 2005 Miss USA's. I had 44 guys in the heavyweight division. And that was hard enough, right? <clears throat> and then, you know, I won the overall fact remove rack from the light heavies one. But there was a person who I was friends with that didn't win the pro card that night, and that was Marcus Haven. And he was doing the supers, and we had met when I competed at the juniors the month, we, month prior. And he was with Metrics Worldwide, and I hadn't done that deal with Frank yet. But I remember just we would text each other. We would be like, you know, just encouraging one another, like, hey, I want to see you in that overall. Let's let's fight. Let's let's do our thing. And when he didn't get selected, um, I'm over here in the back, right off the yeah, stage, stage right. Um, we walk off, and I'm being interviewed by Peter McGuff, the late Peter McGuff, and then I believe Sean Perrine was back there as well. Mm. And I had to cut the interview because I saw Marcus crying. Because I know how hard it, it it hit him, right? So there's a picture. I hope uh, Jake Wood or someone with Flex Magazine can find this photo. It's in Flex Magazine. They got a picture of me with my Mr. USA trophy in one hand and my arm around him, consoling him, letting him know, like, hey, you're going to turn pro next month at the freaking North Americans. Don't let this bother you. But the point I'm making is that it mattered so much to where you saw grown-ass men who may have – Randolph Cheney was in my division that year. He went up a, a division, and this is a person that was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mark Dugdale the year prior, right, mm -hmm. in light heavies. He decided to go up and didn't even make the top 10. Wow. And I just saw his face like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, you know, your heart starts pounding like, holy crap, man. Like, I'm in the next round. Like, this is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. but, I, but I think – what we're all agreeing on is that you kind of have to have stories like this. Therefore you can have ones to share, but when person only turns pro who isn't like person that's box office, they do two shows, they turn pro and we, I don't even know who you are. 
then we know, you know, like, good job, man. Like, what am I supposed to tell you? Like, hey, I might be your pro. I'm like, that's cool. What do you, and, you know, you don't want to like posture on them, but at the same time, you want to encourage them and say, hey, man, what's your, what's your goals with this? And at right. the same, you know, oh, I want to be, you know, the champion of the world. And I go, well, here's what you do. You say it one time out loud to, to where everybody can know what oh. you're going I want to say one thing because I want to go back to what Frank said, just so that everybody that's watching this and goes, oh, you can't cap on somebody that was doing this. We don't go out and buy a Ferrari and show off the Ferrari. We're not buying the big house to show off the house. We are in the fitness world where we show off our physiques. And so if somebody's upset about what Frank said, I need to clarify something. That's the field we're in. And so if you're walking around bragging about you're an IFBB pro or whatever you are and you're bragging mm -hmm. about it and it doesn't look like you're much, that's an issue. And that's offensive because it's it, that's what we do. And so if you're walking around saying that, am I way off there? Because I feel like that's exactly no. what we live in. And that's the point. You weren't trying to cap on a guy. You were capping on a guy that Mona just, you know, trains twice a week and walks out and looks better than it's go back to that. that. It go I can equate that to back in the day, Mike, when we talked about this the other day, when you went to the newsstand and you were on the cover of every magazine, I was on the cover of every magazine, and people in the gym come up to you and you're like, Hey, how are you? Can I help you? Whatever question you want to ask. And then there's that one guy who has a, a stamp size picture in the 200 and page, page 287 in the back of flex who's like yeah i'm in flex magazine uh, you know i'm killing it yeah maybe one day you'll get there if you look like me that's what i'm talking about i'm not talking about yeah people who are you know i'm talking about if you're a pro then act like a pro don't go around this guy was just to, to go back was bragging and putting people down and he didn't look like any he wasn't like giving advice I wasn't, and he just did two shows. There's probably three guys in his class. And I was saying that the guys who are more accomplished, been through the wars and stuff, have a deeper keep it. for the IFBB Pro League and everything else, and people in general. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, that guy. I, I grew up in a family of martial artists, and, and that was the upbringing for us, very <clears throat> martial arts based. Mom did it and uh, stuff, and we all kind of competed in martial arts. And so we grew up with that kind of, uh, Peaceful warrior, uh, respect, yeah. uh, walk behind the individual, um, look them in the eye when you shake their hands, not this kind of Hollywood look off. Uh, if you're talking to somebody, stay in the conversation. Um, and, yep. and me and Lee Haney just talked about this. It's a it's an odd thing that the and I think it's the respect. It's like if, if you're there and you're a champion, be respectful, be respectful, not just to yourself, but to the organization of what you're doing. And then understand that you're that you're the billboard. Yeah. So you're out there bragging, oh, I know everything and this and that, and uh, you guys don't know anything. You look like shit. It's like, hey, that's a tough one. That's pretty rough, man. You know, that that I mean, everybody I think has a, a, a level of insecurity, right? Especially people that compete at a high level. But to to talk down to anybody or to try to posture, I can't stand it. So, you yeah. know, try to you try to do your best to listen to them and then you just try your best to kind of like ghost. <laughs> but, you know, I think um, it's exciting that we get a lot of people that want to compete. I think their reason why is going to dictate whether or not they have, have a good career. And because it's not going to always be about um, how you place, but it is going to be about how you made people feel. So if you're not going to look that great, <laughs> the last, you should be like the mayor at the gym, you know, like, <laughs> You should be, you know what I'm saying? Like, you should be that guy or that girl that, like, you, you've you built so much solid community that even if you placed 15th out of 10 people, 15th out of 10 people, right? Yeah. People are like, oh, man, better luck next time. Yeah, he didn't win, but he's such a good dude, man. He helped me and my wife and this and that. And that's the person of service. And I think what happens is that when you level up in, in your profession, there's something that goes haywire. And I think it's this, you forget that you've been blessed and highly favored to do these things. And you fail to recognize that now you're in a position with people following you that you get a chance to teach them something. So what does that mean? That you have to serve them. You have, yeah. you, and yeah. what, 
serving them? Like, what are you serving them? Because we all know if you serve them the wrong things, they will be the person that makes all of these non-competitive people talk trash about our sport. Because mm-hmm. there are people, oh, man, you know how many times people don't want to come up to me because they may have seen someone, you know, low level act like a fool. Yeah, you know, it's, in, it's in, not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, yeah. you, I grew up around, since I was 19 years old, Steve Weinberger. And Steve and Jim Mannion, and then obviously JM and Tyler. But the one thing that they all have in common is that no matter what level of competitor you are, they will take the time to talk to you, mm-hmm. give you advice, um, set you on the right track, you know, and some people take that information and they'll, and they'll run with it. They'll be very successful. And some people just do their own thing and whatever they don't, they don't pay attention. But I've seen Steve over the last 30 years, like from every Mr. Olympia, you know, to top pro, whatever it may be, celebrities, whatever, coming in that office and, and, you know, and even low level NPC competitors first show. And Steve will take the time, he'll talk to them and, you know, and and really set them straight. And I think as we get older and as we get older, I think it's important to pay that forward and and to to do that. That's why we all take, I've seen you in the gym, Phil, recently at Bev's gym, I Mike all the time, take the time to talk to people and help them, you know, whether or not they want to use the information. Yeah. You know, and going back to that guy in the gym, he was as helpful as like, no, like, Zero. Like, that's why I look at him. Not even if he had the best physique. He's just a jerk. Like, I, you know, people came up to me in the middle of my set. I took my head, my plugs out the other day, and my training partner's like, you just took your headphones out, your your plugs out, like, 26 times. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, if I don't answer, that's going to be the one person who's like, I really needed the information, and he didn't give it to me. So I'm like, now I'm starting to train at 4 a.m. in the morning because everybody yeah. has to go to work. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, you're to be, uh, but I, I, you know, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? You know, and it, it, it's, it, even the pick the questions are ridiculous. You you're gonna give them an answer, like you know, like how do I get arms like eggplants? Well, you know, like what do I do to lose this? How many times if we had a dollar for that, we'd all have our own? Yeah, the, the, how, how do I lose, lose this lower back? back? Yeah. You guys are incredible. <laughs> Everything do the opposite. Yeah. Like, you guys are incredible. Thanks for taking time today, man. Um, I do want to get get us back on because I want to talk about um, <clears throat> your first thoughts when you wake up, Phil, in the future. Like, what do you wake up and, and how do you get out and get motivated to move through the day? Because you hear so many cliches or echoes about I get up and I do this and that. And me and Frank just – we were having a roast about that. Oh, see, someone did, someone was smart with the bringing the pup in. This yeah. is my dog Mabel. She's a rescue. Nice. They, were, they were to gas her. We got I got her. I saved her. Now she saved nice. me. <laughs> Send me pics, brother. <laughs> yeah, but I, I want to talk about that. And then I also um, Mona wants to get some arm tricks. No, nah, your arms are big enough. Forget it. <laughs> but some other things that I think you guys you guys really understand because you've, you've done it, you've been there and, and you've been there for a long period of time. Cause I do want to go over the idea that uh, health and fitness, if done correctly, you can end up living a better functional life relative to leaving it. Like everybody says, destroyed and wrecked. Yeah. I you think know, they, that routine, I think everybody has to have a routine. Um, if they don't know their routine, then maybe start filming yourself the first hour that you wake up start writing down what do you normally do when you get up if it's just to grab your phone and search through emails or instagram and you just do this until you're okay now i'm gonna go up and brush my teeth wash my face and get on with the day or you know for me i get up uh, i basic ritual man i just get up be in gratitude say some prayers read some scriptures some devotional um i immediately uh just want to wake the whole house up I may put some um, some pods in, listen to something um, more inspiring, motivational. Just try to set my, my my morning right, you know, with some good positivity. I can meditate. I can do whatever I want during what I'm listening to. But it's all information that's positive that gets me at a, you know, like a peak state, right? So then after that, obviously, you know, hitting the shower, doing all that stuff. And then I start um, reading. 
and I always try to read something very applicable to what I'm going through in life. So if it's something that I need to be more decisive about, I, I buy a book on that. If it's something more about like, um, like uh, physical therapy or something like that, like I read about that. If it's something more about the mind, I'm, I'm reading about that. And I'm actually reading it. I'm not like just doing an audio book. Um, so I, you know, get my 20, 30 pages in and then I, by that time I've already, you know, probably had my morning shake and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, my first two hours, I try to make sure it's about me. Um, but Cherie also knows that too. So she participates in her own way. And, um, it's not like I won't stop what I'm doing to go talk to her or something. It's just that I'm trying to dedicate a specific moment in time for myself that I know has yielded some positive growth in my life. So in Sheree, big- we'll, we'll talk to you in the morning. Yes. See, Mo? See? Mm-hmm. See, most, most New York. So, and I'm a 3 a.m. guy. So when I get up, she's like, why are you talking? I haven't had my coffee. It's 3 a.m. Leave me alone. Give me a couple well, hours. Well, that's why I said, not make noise. You heard what I said. I try to not make noise. <laughs> Because I'm- I try to make no, I try to wake everybody up. The dogs up, tighten up. Let's go. Let's train. Yeah, see, I, I'm not doing that. You're brave. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, everybody needs routine, though. I mean, you have to have a routine. Professionals have a routine. Period. I've talked to. I remember I was talking to uh, uh, Peter Guber, who's the uh, owner of Mandalay Bay Entertainment and Film. He also owns the Gold, uh, Golden State Warriors and a bunch of other uh, teams. And he explained, I was at a conference and I was hearing him speak and I later asked, it's like, so what's up with this routine? He does the same thing, Frank, 4 a.m. This is what I'm, I'm doing yoga. I'm doing work. I'm doing this, this, and this. You know, by the time nine o'clock hits, that's when he's ready to work. But he's taken all those, like those three hours to make sure that there's nothing that he didn't get done for himself. And I think a lot of people should probably stop saying they don't have enough time. Um, yeah. You yeah. take, if you take the 24 hours, you write it on the wall and say, how much time did I really dedicate to just surfing the net? Okay. Three hours, <laughs> I'm sleep, seven hours. How much did I train? Oh, three hours because I was f-ing around, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and unnecessary, unnecessary routes on transportation. Oh, that could have been an hour. Uh, Cause I was running late and to an appointment or whatever. You start writing this stuff down. You're like, wait a minute. I still have like an extra three to four hours. Yeah, oh, huge that, difference. Huge yeah. difference between being busy and productive. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't uh, do that, and that was something I was introduced to, you know, as a youth, you know, playing ball and stuff. Because when you go to college, they literally drill you and say, "This is your day. Mm-hmm. You're gonna wake up at this time. Well, you can wake up whenever you want, but this is roll call. And if you're late, God help you. You're like, okay. So from basically from six in the morning to seven thirty at night, every, six days a week. Yeah. You, you have stuff structured. So a lot of people don't know how to deal with that, that idle time. Let me, guys, let me ask you guys something. So during the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, did you like, how did you spend majority of your time? Like, <laughs> because, you know, I talked to quite a, you know, a lot of athletes, you know, they hit me yeah. up and they're like, Oh man, did you catch this on Netflix? And this, and I said, actually, I haven't watched any of that. Shit. They're like, what? I'm like, nah, man. They're like, what'd you do? I said, listen to audio books or buy a bunch of books from Amazon. They're like, for real? I'm like, here's the deal. Anytime when the world stops, and this has been like the first time, right? For, especially for us. Yeah. So in five years, we're going to see who actually did some work. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be a huge gap because people are going to develop bad habits because we saw how everybody ate. Like what they, you go to a grocery store, all frozen food were gone. You know, <laughs> chips were gone. Oh, Beer yeah. was gone. Um, so a lot of people, in my opinion, develop bad habits. Now, I'm not saying you can't watch Netflix. I'm not saying you can't watch TV. <laughs> but I just, I'm curious, like, how'd you guys spend that time? To Man, that was that was insightful because I wouldn't be in the shape I am right now, which would rival any of my times I ever stepped on stage. <laughs> and it's also like a, a better look because it's like the skin is so healthy and everything's so healthy for this movie. And so you're right. You went to audiobooks. I finally got to go and stop guest posing and being in a deficit. And so I got to allow the body to heal, go off season, get my strength back to where it should be, put that memory muscle back on that I was dieting and dieting and dieting off, which allows you what? If you go off season for two years, you get to get in the best shape of your freaking life. And so it worked out good for me. Yeah. So everybody's like, oh, well, 
how'd you do this? I thought you said, don't do cardio. Well, I don't say don't do cardio all year. You don't do it all year. Use it when you need it. Yeah. And so it, it was, you're right. I, I, we, she killed, we ate, we healed the body. We studied, studied, studied more nutrition about feeding the connective tissue relative to just the muscle. And uh, so that's what I did. That's awesome. And then got to spend so much time with my son because he was just born going into that. So I got my first two years with my son without traveling, which was yeah. awesome. Awesome. I was like a caged animal because I was going through a bad marriage in my house. So I was hiking probably like 26 miles a day outside with a beekeeper mask on. But no, I, I actually found it extremely therapeutic uh, to go outside, to be outside. And we spend so much time inside, like in gyms and this. I actually took it outside. I went to parks. Um, I found trails and stuff. And I would put audio books. I would put music or whatever. I'd put it on and I'd go for, you know, I'd look at my clock and I'd be walking for three hours doing trails. Take yeah. the dogs for walks. Take, spend time with my son. Like just doing things because we're so busy that we weren't able to do. And now by doing that stuff outside, the outside cardio and, and doing workout, I still do it now. Because to get out of that gym that you're doing that cardio for an hour and now being able to go outside, and it, it's just, it's now part of me. But I also had, uh, I worked out at Bev Francis Powerhouse Gym. So I was working out there. There was no heat. It was, there was no heat or um, air conditioning. So it was probably about a hundred, in 20 oh, degrees and <laughs> so you know it was dark <laughs> you just kind of but you were so grateful and it made you uh you know really grateful of what you know just going through that drive through getting a cup of coffee and going to the gym was a big deal and that taking that out of your life was a huge change because you're doing it for 20 25 years yeah. you know and now just to go in a gym, I was so grateful that I had an opportunity to do like, you know, an hour work in 120 degree heat, no air conditioning. Like that's how I used, that's how I started at 19. Right. You know, there was none of that. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of, and then after the, after COVID, I got divorced. <laughs> we spoke about that. So, so you added to yeah. the, uh, the, uh, I guess the uh, totals. Uh, you guys both remind me of like continuous students. You love your life so much that you want to continue to learn and try to be the very best you possibly can. I hope that the people that watch today comprehend this is their knowledge, but it's their knowledge also from the individuals. Like Phil just said, he was around somebody that owns this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. That guy didn't get there without being around people. And he was, you know, built his smart and money and finance and up to these guys have been around for decades, some of the greatest individuals, and he sucked up their knowledge because they're students, mm -hmm. applied it to themselves, and then continued to grow like this. You guys are mind-blowing to me. You're awesome. Awesome humans. They had so much to say in this, and I think at the end of the day, I think Phil and myself and Frank are saying we like the individuals. We like the uh, story that you have about your life in real life and not your titles. Um, and again, it's we're again in a cohesive connection of we like humans and good humans and there's bad humans. And at the end of the day, you um, set yourself up how you want, not because of somebody else is telling you you're good or you're bad. Uh, it's about you setting yourself up and, and living the dream and being the kind person that you can be. If you can go back and watch this again and take away the little antidotes that both of them gave to why their whys were so strong and why they've been able to live at this level of, uh, again, longevity to me is at that pinnacle level. Can you get to that upper echelon of life and then stay there and continue to win at that level? That's impressive to me because I know there's always, you're always getting pulled down. And for these both to these both of these guys to stay at that level and continue to win in life is impressive. And there's got so much of the antidotes that they do to stay on top is so impressive and should be learned. I'd rather learn that stuff than their workout routines or how they do their nutrition or how much hours of sleep do they have a night. I want to know how they deal with the stress of outside. 
uh, relationship stuff, um, life stuff, family stuff. That's that's what I'm learning from these people. So that's it, Mike O'Hearn here. This is the Mike O'Hearn Show on Generation Iron. Thank you guys. And again, uh, feel free to comment below and tell me who you would like me to get on here next.